Well, hello there, everybody. Uh, it's Gordon Stone here. Um, I'm the director of the Agribusiness Development Institute, uh, based in Toowoomba. And um, here I am once again with Anthony Coates. Uh, good day, Anthony. Good afternoon, Gordon, and good afternoon those that have clicked on to this webinar. Yeah, thanks. Look, we'll find out a little bit more about Anthony shortly. So just a bit of housekeeping. Um, and I always set our webinars up like this and say, the focus of the programs that we're involved in for a range of sectors, which I'll come to in a moment, are setting up high-performing, self-managing, saleable and profitable agribusinesses. So the word agribusiness is, is used very definitely because our whole focus is on the business side of the operation or the enterprise um, as opposed to uh, the production side, although they have to be, or they're, they're both integral, of course. Um, this is also part of the uh, program that we're running with uh, Meat and Livestock Australia, Ag Force, uh, DAF in Queensland and also Crow Horworth, um, particularly around the Beef Business Mentoring um, Program um, and also in association with Leading Sheep um, who, are, uh, who were part of the group uh, that I'll explain in a couple of minutes about how Anthony and I came to be together. So um, I've explained who I am. So Anthony, and he's just pointed out, he should, I should be, we should have had Anthony Coates AM as opposed to OM. So Anthony was the former old, um, owner of Eidsvold Station, which as he explained to me was handling a tree to stud number two. Um, and over a period of time, he and his wife Sally made a decision to move out of their business. Um, the reason that I, Anthony and I spent time together was a few weeks ago, under the auspices of the Pastoral Profit Program, Anthony and I and a gentleman by the name of John Wetfeld uh, were actually the three presenters in a what we call business growth and transition um, a series of seminars. And so we decided that it was in terms of the follow-up that we would actually come here today, sitting now as we are, not in Longridge, not in Charleville, but actually at the RSL in Gbang in Brisbane, um, to actually uh, go through this this I guess, process of Anthony's with you all. So Anthony, anything you'd like to, um, to say before we get going? Oh, it's been a, a learning curve for me going through the whole program and even going out and doing those forums or seminars. Um, <clears throat> it's clarified a lot of things in my mind and it, looking back over it, uh, there's not a lot I would change in the way we tackled our succession plan. And um, I'm so happy to be able to share it with other people in case there's something that I've done that may be of help to them. Thanks, Anthony. Well, we'll, we'll get going, and traditionally I always open every webinar up um, by going through our 12 pillars of business best practice. Just a couple of other housekeeping things, though, before we uh, get right into it. Um, one is I'm aware many people are on um, internet connections, and so we'll do, and many people sitting on the ends of phones. So we'll do our normal thing, which is uh, curtail too much interaction, but what will happen towards the end is that I'll ask anybody who would like to ask Anthony a question to click on the little box if they're on their um, computer that says questions and just type in a cryptic question there. And Dave, who's the uh, the moderator or the organiser of the back end of this towards the end, I'll ask him to chip in um, and convey any of those questions to us so that Anthony or I can um, uh, answer those questions. And one other piece of housekeeping too is that at the end we'll also ask you to uh, participate in a little survey. It just helps us give um, uh, feedback on how these things go and it will certainly help the Pastoral Profit Program and others uh, find out how useful this has been. So finishing the introduction, which I'll do quite briefly, um, everything we do in our business development programs is built around these 12 pillars of business best practice. So the first thing is have a clear direction about where the business is going and make sure everybody in the business is on the same page. Our focus is always on the marketplace. The question, where is the money? Where is the opportunity to maximise the value of our high value product? The next element of this is all a change of thinking about um, the fact that many of us are in multi-million dollar businesses or million dollar businesses or even hundred thousand dollar businesses still requires us to think in a certain way about our business as a business enterprise, which of course brings us to the money, the people, and running things in a very systematic manner. 
which is why we have the notion of the saleable business because the value is often in a system like Anthony's would be in managing um, his herd in a certain way. We always deal with risk, uh, including re legal risk. Uh, we're always interested in communication internally in the family or internally in the business and externally with the marketplace, which helps us with our sales processes, our marketing processes, and helps add value. And finally, the reason we're here today is the idea that rather than um, a disorderly approach, succession or business growth or transition is happen, uh, handled in a very orderly fashion, including even setting a business up for sale. So that's a nice little lead into our agenda today, which is three things we want to cover off. We want to cover off a change in thinking <coughs> pardon me, about whether succession can be a painful process or an orderly process. Is it, <coughs> pardon me, a transition and could there even be growth associated with the business if we're going to hand it on to another generation or get an investor into the business and grow the business so there's added value? So I'm going to ask Anthony secondly to talk about his experience and then finally we're going to summarise our take home messages from this whole presentation. So. I guess the way I look at succession, because I've been involved in a, in a number of these activities, is the very thing that I want to avoid and the very thing that I want everybody to avoid is what I call a train wreck, which is instantly action is required. There's, there's health issues, there's a falling out in the family, and generally my summation is that everybody loses out of that process because it's done in a disorderly process emotions come into play and all sorts of other things happen, which I'm sure Anthony's going to touch on as reasons why he took the course of action he did. Sometimes though it's possible to predict that things are going to happen, which is where we, our second option, the planned owner exit strategy comes into play, which is we do have time. We do want to have a, an organised process, but we just don't have a lot of time. Our approach, our preferred approach, is really what we call the third option, the grooming the business. So what grooming means is you set things up in a certain fashion so that you can maximise the value and value can be financial, emotional, relational, all sorts of other things. And from our perspective, if people are setting their business up in a certain way, it is actually to use this grooming process or this orderly process to set up this high performing, self-managing, profitable, saleable business. So when we're doing this grooming process, um, there's always a reason why we're doing what we do. There's always, it's always important to see into the minds of the people who are involved in that process, to understand what drives them, to find out what unique things they're looking for and to do it in a systematic manner. Because if there's some kind of transition, there'll be what we call governance that will sit behind it, which is everybody needs to be clear what's going on, the legal, the financial, and all of the other compliance arrangements need to be put in place. And we have this little caveat that we call making the owners redundant. Because if you can actually leave your business for a period of time and have it happen and operate behind you, then that's the real value of the business. And that's the reason why most of us are in business, to be able to take time out. Even if we means sitting on the porch with a beer or a cup of tea uh, and enjoying the fruits of our labour while somebody else does stuff. And what that's about, and I'm going to ask Anthony to comment on this before we get, get going too much more, is the mindset we bring to it, the change way of thinking or our paradigm. So Anthony, I've done all the talking. Any thoughts on this kind of grooming or transition process before we get into our golden rules? Well, <coughs> excuse me, I guess all people in their business um, are trying to upgrade their business as time goes by. And um, in, in my situation, um, while until we decided we better set a succession plan in action, um, we were constantly grooming our business, keeping our mind open as to where we could move that would uh, make us more efficient or keep us up to date. And so the, the business grooming went on over a long period. And even if, if it was to pass it on to some of our offspring, our being my wife and I, offspring, or, or to get a, a, another business partner in or to sell the business, uh, we were constantly in the back of our mind thinking of we need to have a business that's running efficiently so that it is worthwhile uh, for someone else to take over and that they'd want to take it over and perhaps continue to grow it. So Anthony, a question about that. Do you think that 
effort you put in over a long period of time added value to, um, I guess, the sale process and, and value can be financial and a whole range of other aspects? I'm sure it did, Gordon, and for those listening, um, it, some of the value in grooming that business as were was for my own personal satisfaction and that I class myself as, um, without being arrogant about it, as a business leader in the field I was in and um, you only do that if you put a bit of extra time into it and through doing that it, it, in, it, it improved the efficiency of our business and hopefully improved its value uh, to whoever took it on from there. And I suppose from hearing you speak before, um, or in those two other two workshops and since, to, to me that's probably what made it a very attractive proposition as well. It could be broken up, but the, the sum of the parts was what made it so valuable. Well, that uh, in a way it was, uh, uh, the parts were good, but it's, if you run it back to the same old thing, um, uh, a team of, of experts um, that play as a team is so much better than individual experts that could be leaders in their own little section, but we'd built a unit that worked very well together. Okay, so I can see the real value in the, in the unit which you've described and went with the business, so to speak, too. Yeah, that's correct, Gordon. So let's keep rolling, Anthony. Um, so I guess if, if the setup process that you use, as I understand it, is firstly, um, you as a family got together and said, what is the plan? So yourself and Sally and the children and said, okay, so who, who wants to do what? And then you thought, um, let's give this kind of a five-year plan, but let's have a bit of wriggle room. Um, let's be aware that um, things don't necessarily go according to plan, but let's have a, a specific game plan and try and, and work towards that. And I do remember you vividly saying throughout the workshops, always look for the benefit for everybody. So it, before we get into these rules in a bit more detail, can you talk about that setup or your rationale a bit more? Well, uh, we have, my wife and I have three children, all have their own careers. And <clears throat> excuse me, while they were brought up in a rural um, environment and, and their jobs were, were actually related to rural production, um, none of them at, the sta at that stage really wanted to come back and run the business as it was being run. And so as my wife and I approached what was the normal sort of retirement age, we thought, well, it's time to make some plans, get in, call the family meeting, and try to arrange or arrive at an agreement so that not only my wife and myself were happy about the way we are progressing, but also our three children so that um, our family property was a heritage property. It had been our family for well over 100 years. And so um, it really was something very well worth looking after as far as we were concerned and hopefully it would have some value to somebody else. Um, and so we got those uh, things in the back of our mind, we had a family meeting and got rolling with the program. And so if I recall, Anthony, the, the other side of this was that um, your, your children were given a, a solid opportunity to have their say, to see whether they wanted to be involved in the business. There was an amicable agreement to say, no, we need to do something different. And then they were kept in the loop from that point on as the plan unfolded. Well, that was one of our main aims. Was we are <coughs> excuse me, a fairly close-knit family. We respected one another. And while we're all not the same, um, we respected each individual's point of view. And so we gave each of our three children um, the chance to have input into this program and so that we could, when we started off, we all had a clear idea of the ultimate goal and how each person could be involved. Okay, Anthony, well, we've, we've entitled this next slide Key Elements of a Proactive Succession Process. And so the thing that's impressed me throughout this, and I know in our work, it's all about being proactive and, and trying to set things up so that there's no untidiness. So I guess we've set out all of these different, um, what I'm calling golden rules, or, or guess key, what I'd say is kind of key principles that have emerged as I've spoken to you over time. So I guess the, the first one that we've put here is being clear on the outcome. And um, I've, I've put my own words in here because of the work that I've been involved in to say a laser focus to achieve, achieve the chances of everybody winning. 
So what comments do you have on the importance or otherwise or the clarity or the outcome? Well, I guess everyone currently knows what lasers are. They're very concentrated uh, <coughs> focus of energy, as it were. And we wanted ours to work along those lines. And the focus of the, that energy was that win-win deal. That when, when the whole thing came to fruition, that my wife and I would be happy with it. Our three children and their, their families would be happy with it too. And, and also, as the way it turned out, there'd be another young couple um, and their family that um, we aim for them to, to uh, take over the business. We wanted them to go away at the end of it with a big smile on their face too. Mm. So Anthony, the, the, the other principles are going to, I guess, flow on from what you actually did, so to speak. So um, could you briefly describe um, the, the process that you went through so we can look at these other principles? So for example, um, I recall you saying uh, the desire was not necessarily to break the place up. It was to respect the heritage value. It was res to respect all of the elements of the business that had been built to try and find the people with the right ethos that fit fitted your way of thinking so that the business could sort of continue on in the ideal world in, in terms of the outcome that you were seeking. So I guess the question is what, what was that outcome and how did it kind of play out? Well, <coughs> I mean, I'm always believe that um, the harder you work, the luckier you get, but luck does play a lot of a part in people's lives. And it's the way, uh, when I call it luck, I guess it's the way you see an opportunity and the way you grasp that and turn it into a lucky course. Um, and our, we had four, four properties that were run as a unit. They weren't very far apart. They were within half hour's <coughs> comfortable drive of, of the head station. Uh, but they, they all worked very well as an as a aggregation and they complemented one another. And so our real aim was to keep that four block unit uh, as a going concern. Um, financially, it probably would have been a whole lot easier for us to s sell each of those blocks off um, to various neighbours or other interested parties. But to me, that was breaking up something that my forebears had worked toward and that I'd spent my life uh, building on. And so we wanted, if possible, to sell it as a going concern. And we were very fortunate in finding a young couple, being Rick and Alice Greenup, that were looking to expand their business, had the same or similar type of background uh, as our family did. And their age group put them into a peer group with our own children. So we were passing it on to the next generation, as we were aiming to, um, to give them a chance to expand and grow the business and to achieve their ultimate um, objectives and their ambitions. So Anthony, as you were describing that, my mind's going, well, we're talking about the land here, but then there's another layer on the top of that, which is you've got your, your animals. So you've got your stud. You've got all the effort and thought and time and blood, sweat and tears that have gone into um, getting that stud uh, to the place that it was or the cattle to the place that they were. How did that fit into your thinking as well? Well, if we deal just quickly with the land, there were four similar sized blocks, all relatively close together on all weather roads and, and situated around relatively permanent water, whether it be underground water or surface water. Uh, so the land land unit uh, worked well. Um, the stud or the cattle part of it, we were actually stud Santa Gertrude to stud number two. We had a lot of genetic background. I'd spent a lot of effort um, with performance recording to make sure we were right up to speed with the productivity of our, of our animals in that given environment. And uh, we then the greenups were very oriented toward that same sort of deal and the stud part of it as well as the land they were most interested in the stud and the genetics that we had and that became very important to them and also the heritage value of the whole enterprise um, <clears throat> that that carried some weight for them and it, it was something that added up to a, a fairly neat package and uh, in a way I, I presume that um, 
there's not a lot of people around that were interested in that whole package as the greenups were. So we, we certainly, uh, once we found them or they found us, it made it a whole lot easier to work through the whole exercise. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let, let's now look at a few more of those um, um, golden rules or principles. So I, I do remember you saying uh, um, a five-year plan and then it turned into a 10-year plan. And so we've got some concepts here which, which is being aware that it will, things will generally take longer and that sometimes when it comes to difficult decisions you just need a bit of time up your sleeve. So what are your thoughts about this um, second principle about time? Well, the time is, is most important because um, none of us know what's going to happen tomorrow or next week or next year. And um, as you get older, we're not infallible. Uh, we, we, we know that our lives are, are finite, that they can't last forever. Um, so start early. Uh, anybody that's thinking of doing this needs to get going early so that you do have time. Um, to make adjustments, seasons change, markets change, um, business practices change, and often those things will will affect the whole outcome. But if you've allowed yourself sufficient time um, and have that understanding with the people you're dealing with, that as I say, Rome wasn't built in a day. If you need more time, give it time. Don't rush it, um, but understand where you're heading. Keep that ultimate goal in mind. And, and co concentrate your effort on reaching that goal, but don't set yourself a deadline that it has to happen by that time. Okay. So I, um, I believe there were times where you had to do a bit of a stock take, and you had to time, you know, more or less mark time because there were circumstances in the in the process that that ideally required a bit of time to ha to happen. So how did that all work? Well, we, my wife and I, and we were the main negotiators while well, we bounced things off our children in the background, but we were the main negotiators with the Greenups, and we did have a good and open and a free and, <coughs> and respectful um, understanding of one another. The telephone lines were always open, discussions were there, but the Greenups did introduce some external business advisors from their point of view who Sally and I got along with very well too, and they really played a very strong part in the whole process. If um, if there were differences in agreement, we'd, we'd think it through, not argue it through, but discuss it through, and also they were very very good at taking any emotions out of it. If if something that was, the thing was tracking somewhere that perhaps we hadn't anticipated and wasn't really in our original design, um, those external parties would give us a clear, on from both sides, give us a clearer understanding of, of the benefits of perhaps changing track. So I think if you can find the right independent advisors outside, certainly use them. Now some of those people, they're not going to do it for free, it may cost, but those sort of investments I think are very worthwhile. Okay. And so that's that's our third point. Um, and the beauty of the, the the independent advisors is that they could bring their thinking to bear. They could actually we we'll call it facilitate the process because they've got nothing invested in it. I presume, apart from say in my case, my job is to do whatever the client needs done. And so sometimes that does take time. But the the job of the independent party is to keep that emotion out of it and keep the, the process rolling. Is, is that I your think view? it's yeah very important, and <clears throat> the people themselves that are your independent uh, people, if they're like-minded people, um, it's so much easier to get on with them. And the couple that we were working with, with the Greenup, had a, a great appreciation of art, and my wife and I did. Um, and so those those sort of little similarities in your life give you a whole lot more respect for the for the understanding of somebody looking from the outside mm. in you understand that these people have the same sort of mindset as you. It's so much easier then to work with those people and to take guidance from them. Sure. So I guess the summary there from my point of view is common ground, common thinking, a common set of values um, and, and empathy, I suppose. That, that, that empathy is uh, the word, Gordon, you picked it right up. <coughs> Excuse me. You, you know that they feel the same as you, that they have the same aims in life and um, they're really aiming to, to keep all sides happy without 
going down the scale, as it were, um, mm. compromise on the upside rather than compromise on the downside. Okay, so let's keep rolling then. Um, we, we've talked about the, uh, the plan of attack. Um, and so we've said here that uh, we, the, the formalised plan helps keep everything on track. Everyone knows where they stand. If you need to change, you've actually got, um, we'll call it some black and white to change from and something to change to. So how, what's your view on that principle, Anthony? Well, when we kicked off on the program, we did get it down in hard copy. Um, we had <coughs> timelines or, or goalposts, as it were, that we needed to meet along the line. And that was put down in black and white, and everybody agreed on it, with the understanding that it wasn't laid in cement or set in cement, that if, if change needed to happen, we'd get it and discuss it. But so long as you have <coughs> the, the scaffold down in black and white so everybody knows where, how you're progressing to date, uh, where you need to be in the next timeline, um, and then that opens up discussions. And if, if it appears that it might be harder to meet that timeline, only a matter of phone call and discussion and change it. Um, but it's very important that you do have a set sort of goal or a formalised plan that uh, you, everybody's working toward. Okay, so th so the next the next principle is about breaking things down into a series of bite-sized chunks or series of steps. And I guess again, my experience in these sorts of things is that we're dealing with with people, and so when we're dealing with people, particularly families, we've got different behavioural or personality styles and things along those lines. So there's some people who need to see the detail, some people who are worried about the big the big picture side of things. And then ultimately the big picture and the detail needs to come together. So what's your sense then about this um, series of bite-sized chunks and continuing the journey by, by bite-sized chunks, kind of dealing with one and moving on to the next? Well, I think it's, it is handy to have people with different points of view. One of our daughters is a meticulous on detail. Um, our son probably wants to get to the goal quick as you can. Um, but if you listen to all those people and adjust your pr program according to, accordingly, and that makes it again easier to bring it back into parts. That we need to do this part now, um, and maybe concurrently deal with another part. But um, if they need to be separate, they do. And in our program, um, we work through to make it easier that uh, we sell the the stock in a series of tranches quite differently from the land or quite separately and so that um, it made it financially easier for our succession partners to, to come to grips with where they'd find the money and, and work through it uh, <coughs> and it also allowed them then to work the way we set the system up so, so that they could start to earn some dollars out of the, the whole business as it progressed toward the final uh, settlement. Okay, so let's let's move on then, because that's a nice little introduction into the idea of um, breaking the business down to its in, into its parts. And and interestingly, this is actually how Heather Smith set up the whole pastoral profit um, uh, workshop process. That my job is to talk about the big picture, about the business side of the business, so to speak. Uh, your job is to talk about the example. And then John Whitfeld's job was to look at um, some components of where the value is in the business. And so his proposition, or my proposition often is that it's in selling products to people. Um, his proposition is that's important, but then we look at the different business units of which land is one, livestock is another, plant and equipment is another, staff and people with their knowledge, <coughs> pardon me, is yet another. And then the bit I put on the top is, um, all the blood, sweat and tears and knowledge that's coming to you, say, in your lifetime and the value, say, in your start and so on. So how did you look about this, look at this kind of valuing process or the bits of the business? Well, we agreed with the Greenups that um, <coughs> we'd value the land at the start of the, the program. Uh, independently, they had a value, we had a value, we agreed on that and set it up so that they could uh, lease the land uh, for a period, um, by the livestock, they were most interested in our, um, <coughs> our seed stock or our stud cattle um, and 
they didn't really want, they bought some of our commercial cattle, but they had their own cattle they could fill that gap with. Um, <clears throat> they bought those livestock in a series of tranches over four years. Uh, we didn't have a lot of plant and equipment. I always had a philosophy that um, unless you could use plant continually and, and <clears throat> uh, efficiently, it was best to hire other people, let them carry the cost of that. Uh, we had a good staff and we gradually switched that over with the greenups. And the understanding that Rick and I had uh, made that, as you put on the bottom, my knowledge so that I could share my experiences, my understanding of the business that I'd gained over a lot, a lot of years um, to pass on to them. And I was always there as a reference if Rick, Rick needed it to find out how we cope with such and such a problem or how we did this. Our, Rick and I, my philosophy on livestock breeding or stud breeding were very similar so we got on easily with that and uh, that made my aims in life pass on to him very easily. So and now, now that you mentioned that, <clears throat> I do remember you saying that the, uh, uh, the capacity of that knowledge and that practical experience <coughs> of managing livestock on that country in that setting and under a range of climatic conditions and other circumstances proved to be a very valuable part of this transition. Is, is that the case? It did. Well, um, they say you're never too old to learn and while I hope I passed on a lot of my knowledge to Rick and to Alice, who was a very close business partner with him, um, that I learned a few things on the way that um, I always had a thing in front of my desk in my office, is there a better way? And you need to keep your mind open all the time as transition happens, change will happen and often you'll find that what you thought was the best way to do it maybe could take some tweaking and that there were better ways. And I got a lot of kick out of sharing knowledge with Rick and get having looking at things through different eyes and perhaps adjusting what I thought about how the place should be run, uh, helping him to go his way a bit and, and employ my knowledge with that. So Anthony, I, I probably put these words into your mouth or I'll, I'll try it anyway. If we have a family out there looking to go through succession and handing on their business to another generation, then the very principle that you just applied of the knowledge of the older generation being passed on to the younger generation in a uh, in an engaging and highly well communicated fashion is probably quite a critical element, would you think? It is a good old saying that I heard. <coughs> um, we think our fathers fools as wise we grow, no doubt our sons will also think us so. And there is a lot of experience with age. Um, most of it, hopefully, the good things are remembered. But uh, never sort of knock what your parents have, have tried to teach you. Um, think about it. And there's always a different point of view, sure. But um, a lot of that old knowledge that's gained over many years through many seasons is well worth listening to. So let, let's continue on then. Um, so we, we've really probably covered um, engaging the family or those affected as early as possible um, so that there's overall ownership. Is there anything else that you'd like to uh, comment about that that we haven't covered so far? Well, in our situation, and we were in a financial situation that allowed us to do it, that um, to keep our, our own children involved, um, as we, through the succession plan, as various payments were made, Sally and I were fortunately able to share some of those payments with our children to help them with their mortgages on their houses and also if they had a little business so they could em employ some of that uh, capital in their own business. That kept them very much involved as to, as to how the whole thing was going because uh, it wasn't like a, a gravy train to them but they realised if it worked well there would be some benefit for them too and so that, that helped them stay on site and not not sort of argue with what we were doing too much. Excellent. Well, thanks, Anthony. We'll, we'll move on. Uh, so I know this is one of your very um, heartfelt and personal principles about not being greedy, which is leave something in the transaction for everybody. Um, and I've put in there considering the emotional aspects of, um, of this transaction process and that less now, maybe more in the future. So what's your take on that particular principle? Well, Gordon, one of the things through our plan extending from five to ten years, 
allowed us to, my wife and I, to get to grips and our children with the transition that what had been our family property for over 100 years wasn't always going to be our family property. Get used to it. Um, it times will change, uh, but it allowed us to do it. And the extent of the, or extension of the time allowed us to overcome some of those emotional aspects um, of it so much better. And also, in the, the thing did progress gradually, but steadily toward a, and what we saw that, as you've called less now, but perhaps more in the future, um, to, for Sally and I to walk away when we eventually did from the property thinking, well, we've, we've handed it over to another younger couple with a lot of energy that will look after it. We've been able to help our kids with their finances along on the way. Um, and maybe we didn't screw the last dollar out of it, but we felt that, and we, I'm sure Sally and I walked away quite pleased with the outcome. We're very pleased with the outcome. Our children have been, and Rick and Alice screen up while they're having a dry time at home now, and the season's not on their side, at least cattle prices are. And and they, they're feeling that while they took a big step and, and made a big financial commitment, that I'm sure they're happy that what they did, they saw through. And, and ultimately, this is the true win-win-win. So win for you, win for the greenups, win for your family. Well, um, you know, you can't live forever, you can't run things forever. If you can hand something over that you've taken a lot of time and effort putting together and feeling you've given it in, into good management who will grow the whole deal and get some enjoyment for themselves and their family out of it, I think that's a real win. Okay. So, Anthony, before we move on, I'm, I'm probably just going to make a quick observation which I made in the workshops myself. That Examples I've had of the experiences of these sorts of things, particularly the emotional aspects, is that most, most people I know who are in agricultural production enterprises, they and their families have a strong affinity with the land, with their property, uh, with the blood, sweat and tears that's gone into it, often intergenerationally or over a period of time. And I've certainly had the experience where there was kind of a sudden need to get off a property. And it's like many people in that family never quite recovered from that, simply because they really didn't have the time to uh, to ease out of it, possibly even to grieve for the loss of that, that property or that enterprise or, or their connection with the country. Um, and so I, I guess I put that emotional aspects side in there because I'm well aware that that's kind of an unseen element of these sorts of things that people need to be very aware of. Certainly, Gordon, and if you, your family, you and your family have been on a property or run a rural enterprise for a lot of years, there is a lot of personal involvement and a sense of ownership uh, that, you, that is something you need to respect. But um, change will happen. Um, you can't think that I'm going to be here in charge forever. And it will be an emotional hoop that you have to jump through. But if I could say, please, get over it. Mm. Um, go on with your life. Most people in rural areas have had a dog, and it hurts when not one of those dogs passes on. But you get another one, and uh, you become a great mate with it. And your life will move, and you'll find some other good things in life. But um, always respect your past. I, few little things you do. I bought one of my old proper um, weather bureau rain gauges down with me. I still measure the rain every morning if we've been lucky enough to have it. And it hurts me if I hear it hasn't rained at home. But that's part of what's built into you. But uh, truly move on with your life. Don't look over your shoulder too much. What's happened has happened. As long as you're happy with the way it happened, grin and face the future. Okay, we're, we're getting towards the end of this now, so I guess the, um, we, we'll probably whistle through these to some extent. Um, so maintaining open lines of communication. Um, I, I know that you, we've talked about poor communication. At the same time, I all remember you talking about being the bigger person in the communication process. Well, I think that I've been lucky enough in that um, I can try to see generally with the people I know uh, look at things through their eyes, not only my own eyes, and that often you can think you're right, um, but be the bigger person, understand that other people have different approaches to things, and be prepared to give a little ground. 
Um, perhaps they're right and you weren't so right, but um, be the bigger person, understand uh, the way other people think and their own, own uh, emotions and personalities uh, and go with it as it were and, and try and never bear grudges. Um, look to the next day and see how you can make life better um, and particularly with your own family and people you're working with. Okay. So we're, as we gradually draw this to a close, I'm just reminding everyone we'll try to take a couple of questions at the end which Dave will convey back to us. So just write those questions in the question box if you'd like to. So um, principle number 10, which is the emotional aspects, I believe we probably dealt with them pretty well, do you think, Anthony? Pretty well, Gordon, yes. It's uh, what it motivates other people, what they're looking for, understand that and try and work with them toward that final goal. And principle number 11 is aligned to that, which is the subjective things. And I put in there about the garden because I do remember you saying a lot, and I've been involved in this myself, understanding that there are things like a garden that are binding to family members and families at large. So any thoughts about some of those special... Well, I think it's the, the garden bit is particularly important. Uh, while most people in rural or on rural properties work as a team. In most cases, the wife or the female partner is the gardener. She looks after what is your home, your setting, and if it's dry and you're pumping water and you're feeding stock outside, if you can come home to a nice restful garden, hopefully you have enough water to keep the lawn green. It means a lot to you and particularly the person that looks after that. And um, one of the harder things for my wife was when we drove away was to think in that garden that she'd spent some 50 years looking after as my wife, um, she, it wasn't going to be hers anymore. It wasn't going to be the same. But when it's not yours, don't fret about it. Hopefully that it's looked after and valued by the other people. But again, uh, remember the good things it did for you and move on. Okay, so Anthony, we're, we're kind of into the take-home messages. Um, <clears throat> The session now um, before we see if there's any questions. Um, and so I guess the one, one take home message is start early. Another um, take home message from particularly from my point of view is when we're looking at value is how do we maximise the value of any business and that's where we come in because we're looking at growth of the business, transition of the business and if it does need to be sold or an investor needs to invest into it or even if it goes into the next generation of a family, how can we maximise the value? Um, and I guess we're just saying that this grooming process is trying to set that all up in a very orderly fashion. So what, what other comments do you have um, that, that we could use to wrap this all up? Well, Gordon, you've used the term there, maximising the value. Now, if people are looking to maximise the value, um, try and not look at it as um, maximising the dollar return. The value of something is, is A, it's monetary value, but B, it's emotional value too. And the way we were able to work it with the green upset, while we might have, didn't try to screw the last dollar out of it, um, we felt that they got value for, for, for what they paid for. Maybe it wasn't all in, in physical value, but emotional value and that they were growing their business and heading it in the right direction and I always was of the philosophy that you need to leave something on the table for the next person and uh, don't screw it to the last degree, uh, <clears throat> leave something there so that people can walk away with a smile on their face and respect you as business partners or, or business directors. Well thanks Anthony. So. Um I get, Dave, I'm going to ask you to see whether there's any questions there which you could, um, I guess, articulate to us. Um, so those are very good um, sort of final thoughts, Anthony. So Dave, anyone uh, there who's got a question that we could cover off? Yeah, g'day everyone. Um, there's a couple of questions but I think we might just stick to one or two. Um, one of them says the financial strategy of your succession process seems like it could have been fairly complex. Uh, did you did external parties assist with um, assist with this financial strategy? So the, the question, Dave, is um, a potentially complex financial strategy, and and who got involved in 
um, supporting the thinking around that. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. Well, we had our accountant who we'd worked with uh, for many years who understood our business. He gave us financial advice uh, regarding taxation and what have you. And we also made sure that the agreement documents we had were legally binding and legally legitimate. Uh, so that there could be no kickbacks and um, I'm, I'm sure that everybody doing these things need to get that financial and legal advice and um, it'll cost you, sure it'll cost you, but if don't go into those uh, these sort of agreements without having some a good platform that you know you can work from and that is uh, binding and safe. And I'd add another dimension to that too Anthony because um, we always encourage people to actually write things down, as you did earlier in the piece, simply because when the words are written down and people have to review them, there's a degree of clarity that comes into everybody's minds at an emotional and a, uh, an objective level. So the advantage of that sort of advice is things are clear. They're not left hanging in the ether. Did right. And uh, I often referred back to our legal agreement to make sure that I wasn't arguing about for something that that wasn't even in there, that I had in my mind was in there. If it's written down in black and white, you can refer to it and use it as a reference. And I think it's very important that as you progress through your plan, that you keep referring back to those agreements um, to make sure that you are adhering to your side of the agreement and that the other party is too. Okay, thanks Anthony. So Dave, is there any other question or a summary of other questions there that you'd like to put to Anthony? Um, so one other one just says, did the transition process occur over good years um, or were there bad years in there too? Would it have been a lot harder if there were successive bad years? Uh, <coughs> if you look back over the last 10 years, in our district there weren't all good seasons and the cattle market certainly wasn't good. And that, that perhaps pushed us to running from a five-year to a ten-year program. But anybody that's on the land that thinks you're going to get a run of good years in a row, um, that all the planets align, they haven't been in rural production long because it just doesn't happen. Uh, to get seasons right, markets right, po politics right, um, and markets, I say not only your home market but overseas markets, value of your dollar so that that affects things, it doesn't all align like that. So um, I, I, I think we went through a fair few hard years and I appreciate the grit that the Greenups had in their overall aim that they threw, saw through some of those hard years and we did give some ground, sure, to make it easier for them. But um, when you're in primary production in the rural areas, be prepared to, to not have everything aligned properly. And Anthony, I think that was one of the reasons um, about the importance of having extra time up your sleeve. If things like, things like that come, then you don't necessarily have to derail the process because of urgency. There is time to overcome those sorts of factors. Well, that, we, you know, we had an agreement that we had to extend. We could have, Sally and I, and maybe it would have been a little different if our health hadn't held up. We may have wanted to hurry things up a bit, but we were fortunate enough to be in a position that we were able to give the Greeners more time to meet their ultimate aim and it also had a lot to do in my heart and my wife's heart that what we set out to do could be achieved as a whole um, and if it took longer, it took longer. But we're very happy we were able to do that. Thanks Anthony. Um, Dave, any other questions or should we move on? Um, there's a couple more but probably just move on. Okay, um, and so we can uh, always convey answers to those questions afterwards if, um, uh, if they haven't been adequately covered. So Anthony, I'm going to uh, just move on to, I guess, a bit of context here. Um, so I always do this at the conclusion of any of our webinars um, simply because the reason we do um, webinars like this is to, is to bring information to people which is about these business updates and it's been a very, very um, I guess beneficial experience working with you in Longreach and Charleville and here Chibung RSL today um, to I guess uh, have you give of your experience about um, some of the practicalities of we'll call it business management. Uh, we run a series of one day workshops 
and actually they fit into this process simply because we suggest to people that they become the outsider looking into their business and say, our stock take, where am I now? Where do I want this business to be in the future? How am I going to get there? And how am I going to break that down into bite-sized chunks and look over my shoulder and make sure I'm on track to get there? So that's what we're doing with those one-day workshops. The, the long-term 12-month program is simply because um, we say to people, well, sometimes you actually need to have an orderly process to have outsiders looking in helping you, uh, or you actually need, or it's, it's sometimes valuable for you to um, have to work on the business rather than in it to do something like your succession process. So do you have any comments about the value of those sorts of principles? Uh, Gordon, yeah, you, you've been running these programs for a while and you understand the, the value of them. And <coughs> I think anywhere where you can keep your mind open and, and absorb tips or suggestions from outside people are certainly well worth taking the time to do. Um, you can make your own business at home a jail that locks you in. You need to keep your mind open, attend some of these other seminars, go to learning programs and things. I'm sure they'll help you all with your business. And. Uh, <clears throat> It gives you a broader understanding of where the whole world is going to, and I'm sure that for that reason they're well worth attending. Mm. Okay, so thanks. Look, we're on the on the last uh, slide now, Anthony. And so, um, if anyone wants more information, well, we've got an email address there. Um, there's more information about the programs that we run and so on. Uh, there's my phone number, Mark McNamee's phone number, who is um, uh, my co-presenter in some of these programs. Also, Brett Collins's phone number there, who works with Crow Hallworth, and uh, we actually are involved with some um, program succession and business transition activities with Crows. So he could also be the sort of person that a person that listeners could say, "Look, I just would like a third party or some independent advice." Uh, and finally, Anthony, your phone number is down there on the bottom. Um, mm. Are you comfortable for people to give you a call if there's something that's on their mind? Fine. If, if I don't answer the phone, please leave a message. I'll ring you back. Um, the experience that I've gained through this whole program, uh, through my own involvement with our business over many years, I'm all too willing to share. If I can help somebody else through the program, sure, I'm willing to do that and would love, love to help if I could. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Anthony. I really appreciate the time that you've spent again and helping us um, um, set this webinar up. Um, and I guess just commend that to people to uh, listen to and thank you for your time um, and then we'll just all, we'll draw it to a close by reminding people to uh, to go through that feedback process at the end um, which will give us feedback on how this is all gone. So Anthony, thank you and any last words? No, just uh, for those that were switched in on the webinar, I hope you've gained something from it and if you have Perhaps share what you've gained with some of your neighbours or what have you. Most people in rural areas are fiercely independent and I think that can be what keeps you there because you, you, you want to make a go of it, but also can be your worst enemy in that you hold secrets together. If you've got something to share, please share it with your neighbours. For what you share, they'll often have something worthwhile sharing back with you and, and that's the way we'll all progress. Okay. Well, look, thank you very much for your time, Anthony. Thank you all for uh, listening in, watching in, and uh, so on. And we hope you've got something very valuable and useful out of this. And we'll now draw it all to a close. So thank you all for your time. Thank you.